Hello, and welcome to Fraud Talk, the ACFE's monthly podcast. I'm Sarah Thompson, Public Information Officer for the ACFE, and today I am joined by Mary Breslin, a certified fraud examiner and certified internal auditor who is president and co-founder of Verisee. Thank you for joining us today, Mary. Thank you for having me, Sarah. Pleasure to be here. Now, I've been fortunate enough to have attended a number of your sessions at ACFE conferences, and you always have really interesting case studies to share from your years of investigating fraud in a lot of different industries. And our listeners today are lucky enough to get to hear one of those stories. So why don't you start by setting the scene for us? Okay, so this story I chose to tell today, I taste because it's it's got a little bit of everything. <laughs> it's got a little bit of everything for everyone. Um, I was a chief audit executive at a company that offered mining services. They actually called them drilling services on one half of the business, and they manufactured mine equipment for drilling on the other side of the business. So it was two, two major divisions, and the company is very old. Uh, it was about 130 years old when I was there. And audit was fairly new to them. So we had a lot of interesting work that we were done. And my boss had come to me and said, hey, we're having a lot of conversations about our rolling assets. And we think you need to do an audit around rolling assets. There's been a lot of concern. I think the CEO had been at a mine site where somebody had spent $200,000 on a truck, (laughs) which um, you don't do that because trucks last about three months or three years, excuse me, at any given mine site because they just get beat up very quickly. And and this individual had purchased um, the King Ranch edition inside and outside. And so it was roughly a $200,000 Ford 350. And that this kind of triggered the CEO. He was like, okay, we don't have explicit rules around this, so we obviously can't just trust people to do what they want. So they came to my team and said, can you do a global audit on this? And what we're going to do is we're going to hire an individual to come in and manage our global fleet. And part of that will be a project to, quote, unquote, right size the fleet we're going to get rid of a bunch of trucks and vehicles that need to be replaced and some that have already been replaced but not gotten rid of. And so we went out and we did this audit. And while we were doing the audit, they went um, into a hiring process of trying to find somebody who had experience to do a massive project of right-sizing the fleet on a global basis and then also manage the fleet going forward. And so right around the same time that we finished the audit, they found their candidate. And they brought this gentleman on. I'll just call him Charlie for the remainder of the story. And um, he was a really nice guy. And right away, we sat down together upon his being hiring. We kind of went through what we had found in the audit. And what we had found was there was just no standardization. There was just, it was the wild, wild west. Every location, and we operated in like 70 countries around the world. Um, we had like 70 official sites. We were probably on mines in 100 countries around the world. Um, and every one of those like 70 locations was doing whatever they wanted. There was just no controls around um, anything, no global program, process, methodology. And so our audit basically went through and outlined all of the different challenges and opportunities for problems that this could create. And so upon Charlie's being hired, we had finished this audit. We sat down with him. We kind of went through the entire audit. And uh, he was definitely what I would refer to as audit friendly. He was like, oh, this is great. It's a roadmap for what I need to do, what I need to fix. This is fantastic. And we kind of told him, okay, well, we know that the project that you're doing is going to take roughly a year and a half. And here, ding, 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 lesson number one, mm-hmm. we told him, we'll come back in roughly a year and a half and we'll revisit the items on the audit. We'll come back, we'll look at the action plan because there was a lot of work that needed to be done in order to standardize this. So we told him his time frame. <laughs> we told him, you have a year and a half before we're going to, before audit's going to look at anything. <laughs> 
<laughs> so that's lesson number one. If you're keeping track of all the lessons I'm going to tell you during this, because there's a lot of them in this story. Yeah. And uh, we go on a merry way. And roughly about a year and three quarters later, I guess, a year and a half later, maybe a little bit longer than that. Um, I pull into the parking lot after being on a trip overseas. I had been gone about three weeks and I pull into um, the lot and there is a brand new Audi, um, an Audi, uh, Audi R8. It's a two hundred thousand dollar car, okay, mm-hmm. and it's all the way in the back of the lot, and it's parked diagonally across four spots. But the only reason I knew anything about this car was because it was the lust car of my husband. This was the car he always wanted. He still talks about. It. We saw one on this, the road the other day, and he was like, "There's my car." <laughs> I didn't know what he was talking about, so we got up to it. Um, he is in love with this car. He would send me articles on it, text me stuff about it. It's the only reason that I knew anything about this car to begin with. I'm not a big car person. And so I see this car and I immediately recognize it because my husband has taken 10 years to educate me on it. And I'm like, wow, that's an expensive car. And I instantly knew it did not belong to any of the executives because roughly six months earlier, the executives had all gone through this new car buying frenzy. Like they all bought a new car and they have this competition amongst themselves, not to see who could buy the most expensive. The parking lot wasn't filled with Lamborghinis and Maseratis or anything. No, their competition was to see who could get the best deal. <laughs> so they were all trying to out deal each other. And the most expensive car that anybody had bought was actually my boss, and he had purchased an Audi A6, so not an Audi R8, which is this high-end sports car, but he had bought a regular sedan, uh, definitely on the nicer end. The other thing I knew was the the group of executives I worked for there were a really honest, ethical, hard hard-working group of individuals. They didn't really give themselves a whole lot of perks, but one little perk that was kind of a practice, not a rule, was there was this little cutout parking area that was close to the front entrance, and that's where the executives parked, primarily because they got there before everybody else. But also, it was an unspoken rule. Other employees just didn't park there. Everybody let the executives park there, and everybody else parked, you know, 30 feet back mm-hmm. and from that point back. So I knew where they parked, and I knew this was one of their cars, which made me think, well, whose car is this? And, you know, what ha- no matter if you're a seasoned fraud examiner or not, your brain starts to fill in the blanks and tries to make sense of what it's seeing, and it tries to make sense of it in a way that's not fraud. <laughs> that's not a bad thing. So I'm thinking, oh, maybe it's some high-end salesperson, something, right? Remember, I've been gone for several weeks, so I have not seen this car in the parking lot day after day or anything. Um, but I go in the, into the office, and if you ever want to know what's going on, there's one person you always want to go to, and that is the receptionist, because everything that's happening in an organization, that receptionist is probably in one way, form, or another. Privy to, seeing part of, being letting people in and out of the building, they know. Yeah. So I go up to her and I ask her, you know, hey, I just passed this gorgeous Audi R8 in the parking lot. Still has dealer tags on it. Whose car is that? And she's like, oh, yeah. Oh, everybody's been talking about that. That's Charlie's. Hmm. And I'm like, okay. And so I'm walking to my office and I'm the chief audit executive. So I know how much money everybody makes, right? <laughs> we do payroll audits. Like we do executive compensation audits. Like I know how much everybody makes. And uh, I'm walking to my office and I'm doing the mental math, right? I'm calculating in my head. And all I can think about is if Charlie just bought a $200,000 car, he's either in debt up to his eyeballs or he's living in a van down by the river, right? <laughs> That's the only way. Um, or option three is somebody's, maybe us, paying for it, right? Yeah. So I go to my office and I start thinking about Charlie. And one of the things that I am thinking about is how audit friendly Charlie was. Not only was Charlie, this is great, it's a roadmap, but Charlie probably came back to myself 
and my team, and he, in, in hindsight, I realized something, he would not just come to me, which would normally be what a senior manager would do, would come to somebody who's on their level, but he would often just go to my employees, to my team, and ask, hey, you know, I read this in the audit report, I read this, and right here it says, like, this could lead to fraud. So I was really curious about that, like, how can it read, lead to fraud? And um, multiple times he came back over and over again, overly interested in what about this and what about that with the audit report. He was clearly, literally using the audit report as a um, pathway, a road um, to success, <laughs> not in the way we, we thought, unfortunately. Um, now, just because Charlie had bought an expensive car didn't mean I could start a fraud investigation on that right. I didn't have predication. So I decided we were going to start looking at some of the follow-up action items. And a few things started to pop. Again, I didn't wasn't sure I really had a case to start a, you know, a fraud investigation. But I thought, you know what, let me just talk to him to tell him I want to, you know, follow up on some of the items and stuff. And it had been about two, three weeks since I had seen the car in the parking lot. The car was there every day at this point. We had started poking at a few follow-up items with um, action items that kind of off of that global audit. And I went, I talked to my, my boss and I said, you know, I think we should start this follow up. And I really wasn't sure I wanted to use the fraud. My boss frequently yelled at me about finding fraud. As a matter of fact, on more than one occasion, he had said, do you have to find fraud everywhere you go, Mary? Does there <laughs> have to be fraud everywhere? And to which I, of course, responded, it, there doesn't have to be, but there appears to be. So, yes, <laughs> be glad I'm finding it. Um, there's a lot of fraud and corruption in the mining industry, unfortunately. So it wasn't like um, it was that difficult to find. But something came up that week. We were having cake day, which I don't know for you listeners, if you've ever worked in an organization that does cake day, it's where the company will order various number of birthday cakes and send them to all the break rooms. And they will send out an announcement saying it's cake day. We're celebrating everybody's birthday, anniversary, whatever. And they'd have a list of everybody's birthday, anniversary that occurred that month. This week was cake day. And so I knew Charlie. Didn't ever miss cake day. <laughs> I had seen him stock out cake day on more than one occasion myself. So I decided to casually run into Charlie at cake day. Casually being, I basically hung out there and stalked and waited for him to show up for about 45 minutes <laughs> and then casually bumped into him. Um, I waited till Charlie had a big old mouthful of cake and then I did this. I walked over to him and I said, hey, Charlie, I heard that that beautiful Audi R8 in the parking lot is yours. Oh my goodness, that is my husband's favorite car. I gotta, I want you to come out and take a picture with me with the car. Oh, can I drive the car? Oh, just, just, how about I just sit in the car and you take a picture of me in the car? And I'll say to my husband, I'll make him so jealous. Oh wait, how about if I drive the car? Just a couple little, you know, you can be in the car with me, but then I can send a video to my husband. My God, that car is so spectacular. I bet it corners like it's on rails. It must be amazing. What on earth made you decide to buy that car? I mean, this is an incredible, it's kind of expensive, isn't it though? I mean, how do you, you know, my husband is trying to convince me to justify that. How did you, how did you convince your wife? And I can see Charlie, who was a ruddy, complexioned individual. All of the color is now draining from his face. His mouth has apparently gone dry because he gives me that, like, give me a second, like, motion with his finger. And he reaches over and he grabs a bottle of water and he starts drinking a bunch of water. I'm sure to wash down the now very dry cake in his mouth. And he says to me this, you're never going to believe this. And I think, I bet I'm not. <laughs> And he says, it's a really funny story. And I think, I bet it is. <laughs> and he proceeds to tell me, look, my wife inherited $250,000 from a relative she didn't even know she had. Hmm. And two things immediately went through my mind. The first was nonsense, because that doesn't even happen in the movies. And nobody would write that in the movies because nobody would ever believe it, right? Two was this. Your wife, your wife inherited $250,000. 
and she let you spend 200 on a car. For the ladies that are listening, how many of you believe that? <laughs> so we have this moment where I'm looking at him and he's looking at me and he knows I don't believe him and he knows I suspect him of something. And I can see that he knows that. And I know that he sees that. I know that I see and he sees and we both see. And then we both kind of move to our respective corners. I know he knows. He knows I know. Right. Yeah. And I go immediately to my boss's office and I happen to work for general counsel in this particular organization because we did so many fraud investigations, so many audits actually turned into fraud investigations. And so I go to him and I say, I think I have a problem. And he says, okay, start an investigation. So I pull my report out, the audit report out. We start going through it and we look at, you know, what could possibly be abuse. Well, there's a lot of things. But one of the things that stood out to to all of us was the right sizing of the fleet. In order to quote unquote right size the fleet, uh, an estimation had been made that we were going to sell roughly 50% of our rolling fleet. And we had at that time probably 60 or 70,000 rolling vehicles. And so we were going to sell roughly half of those, auction them off, and we would replace roughly half of them with new vehicles. So there was going to be a lot of movement, buying and selling. And how we were getting rid of the vehicles that we needed to get rid of, because they were old, they weren't safe anymore, whatever, whatever the reason was, um, was we had engaged two auction houses, two big auction houses. One was headquartered in New York State. One was headquartered in California. And both of them had auction facilities all over North America. And we had started the project with North America. There were other ways of dealing with it in other parts of the world. But the big first movement was in North America. And so, you know, I went down to accounting and I asked them like how does this work with the auctions they're like well you know um each of the locations has does an assessment you know based on what we know you know they're relying what Charlie had told them and Charlie then gives approval to dispose of certain number of cars or vehicles and approval to replace them and then he approves what's going to be purchased and once all of that is done, then the auction facilities will come pick up the vehicles. They'll bring like, you know, car, vehicle, trucks where you can load, you know, seven, eight, ten vehicles on it and they'll take them to auction. And I said, then what happens? And they're like, well, then he brings us the report from everything that's been auctioned off. And, you know, we put the information in the system. So whatever the the salt, the cars were sold at, you know, the fee that we paid the auction house and we remove the asset from the register. If it's even in the register, that was one of the big problems we had was a lot of the assets weren't even recorded at a global level. They may have been recorded on a spreadsheet somewhere at a local level, but corporate did not really have its hands around everything that we owned. Hmm. So that was part of the problem. So I'm like, so the report comes, to Charlie and she's like yeah he brings it down she's like it's in the envelope from you know the company it comes from and stuff and I'm like okay and I go back to my office and I pull my team in and I go okay we gotta reach out to these auction houses and get copies of everything that has been sold and we reached out and they were able to get us stuff by the end of the day so it was very quick Hmm. And I had a great data analyst that worked for me, and he was able to pull down all the records of everything that had been recorded in our accounting and all the records of everything that these two companies had sent to us. And we thought we had this great process in place, right? Every sale, every purchase, every auction was being approved in advance. Accounting was recording everything. They were updating all the asset registers as everything was happening. Here was the, the one segregation of duties. That was the massive lesson learned that we missed. The reports and the checks were going to Charlie. Mm. 
And we pulled the contracts and it very explicitly said in the contracts and we got on the phone with these auction houses and they were very quick to give us electronic, the electronic data associated with every single sale, what the blue book value was, what the car actually sold for, what their fees were. Everything was beautifully broken down and they got it to us within hours, both auction houses. And we compared it to what was in our books, and Charlie was giving two to three thousand dollars on every single car that came through. Wow! And how he had done this was this: he had gone to our local bank, the bank that we did a lot of business with, and he had opened up three look-alike bank accounts: one that looked like our organization, and one that looked like each. So two more: one that looked like each of the auction houses. And when the check would come in, he had social engineered his way into the hearts of all of the bank tellers at the bank, and he would go deposit it, and then he would move the money over to the account for the lookalike of whichever organization had done that round of auctions. And using Adobe Pro, because Adobe Pro is the arch nemesis of every fraud examiner out there, he would change all of the reports. They were sent to him electronically because he asked for copies electronically in addition to a copy being sent into the mail. And he would alter them to reduce the amount that was received. He would print out a new check on the lookalike account. And, you know, to make it extra special and make it look really valid, he would put it all back in the envelope that everything was mailed to him. And a couple of things that came out was one, nobody had ever thought about this new process that he was building was in reaction to the needs seen by the executives and this audit report that we had had issued. And nobody seemed to realize that we probably should have vetted the processes he was putting in before we went back and actually followed up on the action items. And so he would bring it in. In about 18 months, he stole $1.8 million from us. Wow. Very quickly. Yeah, very quickly. And we, in 36 hours, we were done. The investigation was fast, fast, fast. Um, I had to go to my boss, essentially with my tail between my legs, and say, so Charlie stole $1.8 million from us that we can prove. And I'm pretty sure I taught him how to commit fraud. <laughs> Not something because. you want to you want to tell your boss. Not exactly <laughs> my <laughs> proudest moment, right? I'm like he was he was over involved in the process. I had shown the gaps in the process. He had come back and he had looked for gaps in and asked for explanations of how these gaps could lead to fraud over and over again of my team. And I'm pretty sure that we might have helped this along. <laughs> so not not my best moment, right? Um, he was also highly over-involved in everything, which, you know, experienced fraud examiners know. Somebody being over-involved in an area or in a process where they don't necessarily belong, don't need to be, that's a massive red flag, and we missed it. The other massive red flag that was missed that was a big lesson learned was, you know, when we when we look for fraud, we're looking for red flags, right? But red flags fall into multiple different categories. You know, it's a red flag of the actual fraud, of the transaction, you know, related to the fraud, or it's a red flag of how it's concealed, or it's a red flag of conversion, right? How the fraudster converts the money to something that they have control over that they can then use personally, you know, a red flag of, you know, how it's controlled, like how the fraud is managed, you know, and sometimes we look for what's missing, which is also really just a red flag of the actual transaction itself. Here, the red flag that was glaring the minute we saw it, we couldn't unsee it, was the bank account, the conversion. So (laughs) both auction houses had apparently banks that were headquartered in Salt Lake City, even though they were headquartered in New York and California. (laughs) In hindsight, obviously, we that should have been an indicator, right? 
a company that's headquartered in New York and a company that's headquartered in California is not very likely to be issuing checks off of the bank down the street from the, our headquarters. Yeah. <laughs> and that is, in fact, what was happening. And we missed that, right? And, of course, afterwards, we had some fraud training for, <laughs> for everybody around things like this, um, you know, to be on the lookout for that type of thing. But we hadn't up to that point, you know, had um, – that type of training for our accounting team. So I'm now proud that we have caught this guy. We've caught him so quickly. My my boss, who's general counsel for the company, he reaches out to the authorities. The authorities come in, they have him arrested. But I'm at the same time, I'm like a little upset with myself that I feel like I contributed, you know, that this was, uh, he learned a lot from the audit. And that's like an auditor's worst fear is that we tell them too much and we actually give them the keys to the kingdom instead of helping them secure the kingdom, right? Yeah. And I felt that I had I had done that. And um, I was a little bit vindicated when this happened. Two days after he was taken out in handcuffs and my boss was a big advocate of fraud alerts and you know, making it known, having people taken out in handcuffs was, was definitely his preferred if that was an option, if somebody committed a large fraud, crime against us. But he wanted everybody to know that we were actively looking and that we were doing things to not only prevent and detect, but then there were consequences and, and such. So after Charlie was taken out in handcuffs, two days later, I had a chance to be slightly validated, vindicated, feel better. Is really what it came down to. He calls me into his office and he says, you're never going to believe this. And I'm like, oh, you know, I feel like I, this is how this whole thing started. What somebody <laughs> saying to me, you're never going to believe this. And he goes, no, you're never going to believe this. He goes, I just got off the phone with the assistant um, district attorney in New York. And I think it was like out of Buffalo or wherever. And I'm like, okay, why? He goes, they have a search warrant. They have a, a, an arrest warrant for Charlie. And I'm like, what? He's like, yeah, he committed almost the exact same crime at his prior company. It just took them two years to figure out what had happened. Wow. So Charlie <laughs> actually ended up getting um, five years for, for the crime against us. He pled, so we didn't have to go to trial. And uh, upon his release, he was arrested and was brought to New York and had to go through the same process again for the prior company. So he ended up at, right back in jail in New York after he got to jail in Utah. <laughs> so uh, I felt a little bit better knowing that he was, in fact, a that rare three, five percent of people who take a job with the intention of committing the crime, not just an opportunistic um, fraudster. So yeah. I may have expedited the problem, but I definitely didn't necessarily lead to it with that particular individual. Yeah. And so, also the difference in length of time it took the New York investigation, you said it took like almost two years or so for them to figure out what had happened versus your 36 yeah. hours. <laughs> yeah. Since he had left, it had been two years since he had left them. I don't know how I was not privy to the details of that case. So I don't know how long it had been going on there. You know, um, it had been going on with us. I think it was roughly about 15 months. So he got away with it for 15 months and he stole 1.8 million that we could prove in that time. I, my guess is that there were other things he was doing as well that we did not expose um, because, you know, that's kind of what happens very frequently is there's more than one scam that's going on with these guys, especially somebody who's, a, you know, a repeat offender. Yeah. Absolutely. I wanted to go back just a little bit to you sure. talking about how how it's kind of an auditor's worst nightmare or a fraud examiner's worst nightmare that it's thinking that you laid out step by step how they might how someone might commit fraud. Mm -hmm. And I know that um, some of our members that I talk to, they say that that's one of the reasons that their organization might be leery about giving anti-fraud training to employees, saying like, how are mm -hmm. we are we giving too much away? Are we giving too many details? Do you have any advice for how and 
someone in your position or even just a fraud examiner who wants to do fraud training, how to find that right balance that you're giving enough information that it will, you know, take your average employee and make them be able to recognize red flags that might lead sure. them to to giving a tip that exposes fraud, giving them that information, but not giving away so much or too much that would lead them to then think, oh, I could commit fraud now that I know all this. Sure. So I know folks like myself who um, worry about stuff like that. Most have not experienced it. I have, right? So it actually happened to me, but I will tell you, it is extremely rare. Um, one is you can, you don't have to create a, like a roadmap to how to commit the fraud. Um, I teach, you know, professionals, anti-fraud all the time in the audit world, fraud examiners. And I have been saying for many, many years that I expect that the fraudsters will start taking those classes. Like I don't doubt that for a second, right? Mm -hmm. Here's the thing. Here's the most important thing. It's not about what information you provide when you're doing fraud awareness training. It's about who you're training. The average person is not going to become a fraudster. The average person just wants to do their job and be paid for it. There's only a limited number of people who actually see that opportunity, have that pressure, and then can rationalize it. The vast majority of employees in every organization are good, honest people. Turn all of them into fraud fighters. If you train all of them to know what to look for, then who cares if you taught one or two bad guys some tricks? Because now you've got 95% of your employee base who are the good guys trained to see the problems. I would much rather risk having taught somebody what to do so they could commit a fraud that one or two rare instances, I've done hundreds of fraud cases. It's happened to me one time. I've been providing audit reports for 30 some odd years. It's happened one time. This one makes for a good story, right? <laughs> I would much rather turn everybody else in the organization into a fraud fighter because we've given them good fraud awareness training and they understand what fraud is when they see it. The average person doesn't raise their hand and say, I think this is fraud unless they've had fraud awareness training because their brain is rationalizing. They think more it's like waste and abuse. They think somebody else should be seeing it. Without the training, you're gonna, not going to turn all the good guys into fraud fighters. And I would much rather risk teaching one or two bad guys a trick or two and then have thousands of other people who are fraud fighters that are likely to spot those bad behaviors then worry about not teaching one or two people and not turn those thousands into fraud fighters. So is there a true risk there? Sure. But it's easy to balance the scale by teaching everybody what to look for, defining where the line is between waste and abuse and fraud in each per each organization so employees know where it is. You know, one of the stories I teach I talk about all the time is defining fraud and I talk about my experiences in all these different industries that I've had the fortune of working in. You know, I've worked on Wall Street with the Barclays Capital for years. I've worked, I started my career at Price Club, which is now Costco Wholesale, right? I've been in mining. I've been in manufacturing. I've been in uh, retail banking. I've been in all these different industries. And I can tell you that when I was on Wall Street, dropping $5,000 at dinner was not unusual for traders and wealth management folks. Have it all the time. Somebody at Price Club or any manufacturing company I ever worked for dropped $5,000 at dinner, they would be fired and the police would probably be waiting for them to show up for work the next day. Two dramatically different reactions to the same exact event. And you can't expect employees to know where that line is drawn unless you teach them. And only then when they're comfortable with calling fraud, potential of fraud in real time, are you going to get people to raise their hands? And the only way to do that is to teach them, is to provide the training. And so that's, that's my opinion and that's my advice <laughs> is it's worth the risk. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Because even just boiling it down to a numbers game, like you were saying, if 95, I think that... I optimistically would like to think that that number is even low, 95% of good guys. If we say, you know, 98% yeah. of good guys and that 2% of bad seeds, that yeah. they're 
they're more likely you have now if it was a company of 100 you have 98 extra pairs of eyes and ears exactly. watching and keeping an eye out so even if those that two two bad percent takes a risk and decides to try and start at the very least it probably would be caught a lot quicker it would be flagged mm-hmm. uh, yeah so yeah i'll tell you I'll, t- I'll add a quick little caveat to the end here so another industry I worked in was oil and gas. I worked for ConocoPhillips for a number of years, but I was in accounting while I was there. I wasn't in audit. And um, I was at ConocoPhillips. I was a manager in accounting when Enron collapsed. Hmm. And Conoco and Phillips had just merged. And so we were actually in hiring mode. And I ended up hiring a number of accountants from Enron. Now, it was Enron had just collapsed. Now we look back and we're like, we understand the bigger picture of everything that's going on. In that particular moment in Houston, there was rumors and there was headlines, but we didn't fully understand everything just yet. And so you can judge me on this later, but I hired a couple of those accountants, right? And as things started coming out, more and more news articles, the the books, everything, as things, the information started being released to the general public, you know, I would sit down with those employees and I would be like, hey, you know, I just saw this, or I just saw that. Did you, were you aware of fraud, like, on a massive scale? And they'd all be like, absolutely not. No, 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 no. I'm not sure I believe all this stuff. But if I changed my question and I said, were you guys aware of, like, you know, repetitive, really bad business practices or, you know, waste, abuse? They'd be like, oh, yeah, tons of that, right? And we now know, in hindsight, that those things that they were labeling mentally, bad business practices, repetitive bad business practices, waste abuse, were really fraud. Yeah. But it was acceptable in that culture, and they didn't. They had not been trained. They didn't know where the line was or where it should be, and therefore they didn't even see it, even though they were in the midst of one of the biggest fraud cases in history. The accountant didn't see it, right? So without the training, I think that we put ourselves at way more risk than we ever would by training everyone. Thank you so much for sharing your story with us today. I'm sure that all of our listeners will find it fascinating and pointing out all those those lessons and advice learned from it is really, really useful as well. So thank you for being here with us. Thank you for having me. And thank you for listening. You can find this podcast and all other episodes of Fraud Talk on Spotify, iTunes, or wherever you get your podcasts. This has been Sarah Thompson, signing off.